Welcome to the Private School Leader Podcast, where private school leaders learn how to thrive and not just survive as they serve and lead their schools. I'm your host, Mark Minkus. Let me ask you if you've ever had the following conversation with your spouse or partner or significant other. Just listen to this and see if you've ever had this conversation. Well, where do you want to go for dinner? I don't know. What are, what are you feeling like tonight? I don't know. You choose. Oh, okay. Well, how about Italian? No, not Italian. Okay. Well, how about Mexican? No, definitely not Mexican. Well, then you choose. No, no. I want you to pick. Okay. Does that sound familiar? Have you ever had that conversation? Does the same thing happen in your kitchen when you're trying to decide what to have for dinner? Is what's for dinner a triggering question in your home? Okay, so those are probably things that you're familiar with. But I think that this has less to do with how you and your partner communicate. And what's really happening is that you've succumbed to decision fatigue. Decision fatigue is a real thing, and it's actually a way bigger problem than you think. And as an independent school leader, you make hundreds sometimes even thousands of complex decisions a day. And many of them are high stakes decisions at your school. So on today's podcast episode of the Private School Leader Podcast, we are going to learn about the seven strategies to overcome decision fatigue. So I want you to think for a moment about all the decisions that you make before you even get to school, okay? So these are things that happen from the time you wake up before you even get to school, all these decisions, okay? Do I hit the snooze button? Do I hit the snooze button again? Do I have time to work out? Do I have time to eat breakfast? What am I going to eat for breakfast? What am I going to wear to work today? Do I need to iron this shirt? Do I need to iron this blouse? Can I get by with the way it looks? It's a little bit wrinkled. What am I going to pack for lunch? What are my kids going to wear to school today? What am I going to pack for my kids' lunch? Should I try to leave five minutes early since traffic was bad yesterday? Do I have enough time to stop for gas or do I need to stop after work? Should I take the shortcut to miss some of this traffic? Oh, someone's in my parking space. Where should I park? So that's just, that's like two dozen decisions. And that's just before you get to school. And I'm sure there are dozens more that I didn't think of and Depending on what your situation is at home, how many other people that you live with, how far your commute is, how complicated it is with the transportation, there's so many decisions that you make before you get to school. And so today we're going to break down what is decision fatigue, what are the problems that decision fatigue creates for you as a leader, what are some of the warning signs of decision fatigue, And then, as I said, the seven strategies to overcome decision fatigue as a private school leader. So let's get started. What is decision fatigue? So I found a blog post and video on oneschoolhouse.org, and it was Elizabeth Katz. And this definition, I just really like it. It kind of has four parts to it. So first of all, the human capacity to make decisions is finite. The human capacity to make decisions is finite. As you approach capacity, your ability to make good decisions falters. You lose perspective on comparing long-term gain versus short-term gain. You make impulsive decisions, you feel overwhelmed, and you procrastinate. And Elizabeth Katz says that when this happens that we get our teenage brain back, quote unquote, teenage brain, And this faltering feeling, this faltering is decision fatigue. When we start to falter, it's decision fatigue. So understanding what causes decision fatigue helps you manage your decision load. And again, that's the last little quote from Elizabeth Katz. Understanding what causes decision fatigue helps you manage your decision load. So I want you to think of it this way. Let's say that you start every morning and you have a two-gallon bucket of water that you take with you to school. And every time you make a decision, some water is scooped out of that bucket. Now, some decisions are small. They're like a teaspoon, and that would be 
maybe what you're going to wear today or what parking spot you're going to take because someone is in the spot you usually park in. Those are small decisions, teaspoon, but some are big, some are a cup or a quart. And at some point during the day, you run out of water. And that's why I think what's for dinner is such a triggering question. And how many of you, I know I'm certainly, this is true about me. How many of you get home and you feel like, you know what? I just can't make another decision today. That's because you used up your finite amount of good decision-making that day. And so that can be a problem. Um, and so we're going to talk about the problems that it causes. So what are some of the warning signs of decision fatigue? Well, before I tell you what they are, I want to make sure you understand that when we experience decision fatigue, we often don't feel physically tired. So that makes it a little bit hard because we're not aware that fatigue is occurring. And so decision fatigue can happen when we feel um, energized or we feel we don't feel tired. And so that makes it really, really hard to notice. But here are some warning signs of decision fatigue. To act impulsively without seeing the consequences of the decision. To procrastinate and do nothing. To, um, to have less regulation of emotions. So getting angry or easily frustrated with colleagues at a meeting. We have less willpower. Willpower is a form of mental energy that can be exhausted. And it's like a muscle that gets fatigued with use. So again, these are all warning signs of decision fatigue setting in that we've reached our decision load for the day. Losing focus in meetings, just feeling like you've lost your edge, feeling overwhelmed, making irrational decisions, and then making a decision because you just want to get it over with. So how do we overcome decision fatigue as private school leaders? Well, the first thing just again, I want to pause and make you understand that this is something that um, we make a lot of decisions every day. Um, I said that we have a, the human capacity to make decisions is finite, and we're going to learn and understand more about it. Um, we've got that two-gallon bucket of water. Some decisions are a little teaspoon, some are a big quart of water, a cup of water that comes out, and we talked a little about some of the warning signs. So how are we going to overcome decision fatigue as leaders? Number one, we're going to acknowledge it exists. Number two, plan your day. Number three, have an index card on the corner of your desk. Number four, proactively reduce the number of decisions that you make. Number five, clarity is your friend. Number six, give yourself fuel. And number seven, Remember that schools are not emergency rooms. All right, let's get into this. Number one, acknowledge that this is a real thing. Decision fatigue is a real thing. I know that sometimes we hear stuff and we're like, okay, that's, that's the flavor of the month. That's the new thing of the month in productivity or in, um, in the literature or in um, Forbes magazine. But there, are, there is a ton of research to support that decision fatigue is a real thing. And probably one of the most famous pieces of research, um, there was an article written in the New York Times in 2011 regarding research that was done in Israel regarding pro um, parole hearings, excuse me, not probation, parole hearings, uh, prisoners that were applying for parole. And they researched 1,100 hearings over 10 months. And during the first two hours of the workday, 70% of those prisoners were granted parole. And in the last two hours of the day, less than 10% were granted parole. And they dug into, they really tried to drill down, the researchers tried to drill down into the numbers. And they talked to the people on the parole hearing board afterwards and they held no ill will towards the prisoners in later in the day. Um, some of the crimes that they were serving time for later in the day were the same or, or less severe as ones who were granted parole earlier in the day. And so the researchers came to the conclusion that 70% during the first two hours 
and less than 10% during the last two hours of the workday, that the only conclusion that they could draw is decision fatigue had set in and that they were much less likely to grant parole because of the time of day. Another research a piece of research is from the Royal Society of Open Science, and it's about bank loans. And I believe this was in Canada, and um, it was about people coming in wanting a loan at a bank and loan officers at the bank. Again, a similar research study to the one done in Israel with the parole hearings. The percentages high in the morning and very low in the afternoon, especially the last few hours of the workday couple of other things to convince you that this is real. If you've ever bought a car, a used car, especially if you are buying a new car, you know that it can be a long experience. It takes hours. And when the bells and whistles about the, well, do you want the heated seats? Do you want the backup camera? Do you want the uh, moon, the sunroof? Um, do you want the extended warranty? Think about when in the process, let's say that the whole process took five hours. When in the process are those questions asked? They're always asked late in the process, just before the deal is closed. And that's on purpose because you're at the point where you're just like, okay, fine. Okay, fine. And then the price of the car increases and you get all those bells and whistles because of when they ask you if you want them. And then the last little piece that I want you to think about is, I've noticed this over the last, I don't know, five or six years that if you're at a store, um, like a department store, or let's just say like Marshall's, TJ Maxx, um, you know, Target, place like that, but especially like Marshall's, TJ Maxx. Okay, so to get to the checkout lanes, now you have to wander through a maze to get to the checkout lanes. And what are on all the shelves in that maze that you walk through to get to the checkout lanes. They are all impulse items with a low price point. Oh, look at that coffee mug or look at that little piece of home decor. That's awesome. Why do you think they started doing that? The research showed them that after you made all those decisions in the store to figure out what you wanted in your card and what you put back, that when you're there right before checkout, impulse purchases that's what you make because your decision fatigue has kicked in big time. And I just want you to understand that none of us are immune to this. We can't just tough it out. We can't just be like, well, I can make great decisions at 5 p.m. as good of a decision as I make at 8 a.m. The human capacity to make decisions is finite. And as you approach capacity, your ability to make good decisions falters. All right. Strategy number two. So strategy number one is to acknowledge it's real. Number two is to plan your day. And I want to start this strategy with a little disclaimer. I know, I know, I've been doing this for 30 years. Um, you've been doing it for a long time. Some of you, this is your first year as a leader. And you're like, holy cow, the tyranny of the urgent, putting out fires. I often think about how one of these little squirt bottles that you might see like the size of a Windex bottle Sometimes I picture myself and it's like a little fire extinguisher that's clipped to my belt and I just go around all day putting out fires. And so that's what we do in our private schools. We wear a lot of hats. So I get that the whole idea of planning your day, you know, a kid hits another kid at recess, an angry parent shows up in the office, the board president calls and wants to speak to you. A big donor um, just pops into the office and has a question. I get it. We are not in control of parts of our day, but I want you to shift your mindset and realize that there are things, there are parts of your day where you are in control of those times and when you do certain things. And so to plan your day, you want to front load your day with decisions. I want you to hear this. I'm going to say it twice. Mornings are for decisions. Afternoons are for gathering information to make decisions. So let me hit that hit you with that again. Mornings are for decisions. Afternoons are for gathering information to make decisions. So of course that can't be true all the time. But whenever you schedule meetings, whenever possible, when there are decisions that need to be made, and especially think about the stakes of this decision. Is it a high stakes decision? 
mornings are better. And afternoons, you can gather the information that you need, and then you can even schedule it into your calendar that in the morning you're going to make that decision. But making decisions late in the day is problematic because of decision fatigue. So we're going to be more intentional and we're going to be more assertive, whether it be with our board president or with our teachers or with our secretary, our administrative assistant, whatever it might be. But we are going to try really hard not to schedule back-to-back meetings. And, and you might not have control over what time of day certain meetings happen because of the teaching schedule. And that's when teachers are available to have that third grade, grade level meeting or that middle school teachers meeting. But we're not going to schedule back to back meetings whenever humanly possible. Just remember the probation board research in Israel. Your decision making ability is finite. And then the last thing on this point about planning your day. If you have to have meetings that are close together, even a three to five minute break in between to get a quick snack, to take a quick walk down the hallway, and we'll talk about that more later on, but anything that you can do to move your body or to um, take a get a snack, um, again, try to just put that short break in between. So number one, Our strategies, seven strategies. Number one is to believe that this is real. Number two is to plan your day. And number three is to have an index card on the corner of your desk. Okay, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this one because in last week's episode, episode 11, I talked a little bit about this index card on the corner of your desk. And I also talked about it back in episode seven, the top four productivity hacks for busy private school leaders. And I encourage you to go to episode seven, start listening at six minutes and 15 seconds, listen for about 10 minutes, and you'll know exactly what to do. But I'm going to tell you that if you leverage the power of an index card, and on the corner of your desk, you have this card with your must-do list, and the first word of each task is a verb, that you are going to save on the decisions that you have to make because you will always know what to do next when you're at school. When you come back from somewhere, a meeting, dealing with student problem, whatever it is, you come and you sit down and instead of opening up your email or trying to use some of those finite decision-making abilities, you're going to always know what to do at school. And so I'm not going to go into this. I want you to Number three is have an index card on the corner of your desk. I want you to go back to episode seven, start listening at six minutes, 15 seconds, listen to productivity hack number one, leveraging the power of an index card. And if you start doing that strategy, I promise you that you have a little bit more left in the tank in the afternoon when it comes to making decisions. So seven strategies to overcome decision fatigue. Number one, acknowledge that it's real. Number two, plan your day. Number three, have an index card on the corner of your desk. And number four, proactively reduce the number of decisions you make. So I started this episode by taking you to a scenario where you and your significant other are trying to decide where to go eat or where to get DoorDash from to to your house. And I also said that sometimes what's for dinner is a triggering question. And... I think it's because we have decision fatigue at dinner time. And so I want to just try and help you see that there are ways that you can reduce the number of decisions that you make in a day. Let me give you an example. What you wear to work. So I'm going to tell you quickly about Steve Jobs and Barack Obama and then just apply it to where we work at a independent school. So Steve Jobs, most pictures where you see him, he had a black t-shirt and jeans. And he said that he only had enough bandwidth to make a certain number of decisions in a day and that he didn't want to waste time on deciding what to wear. So he wore the same thing every day. Now I'm not saying that you should do that at work, but Barack Obama during his presidency, eight years, a Navy suit or gray suit. Again, similar philosophy of Steve Jobs. Not going to spend a lot of time making decisions about that. 
And Barack Obama said, I am going to make five important decisions a day. And that was one of his policies for himself. And every once in a while, of course, a crisis would come up and he'd have to make more than that. But he would try to limit himself to five important decisions a day. So let me tell you what I do that is a way to proactively reduce the number of decisions that I make in a day. And I'll tell you, my daughters still make fun of me for this, and I've been doing it for a long time, a lot of years. But I want to tell you that I still do it to this day, and it saves me a lot of decision-making and a hassle um, in the morning. And so what I do is, is that I actually make a calendar for about, I don't know, six weeks, eight weeks, whatever, and I figure out the shirt, the tie, the pants, the socks, and then on the weekend, on Sunday afternoon, I iron five shirts, and then I get everything all organized, um, the shirt, the tie, in the closet, um, the pants, the socks, the undershirt, everything is there, and for the whole week, all I have to do is when I get out of the shower, is get dressed. I don't have to think about what am I going to wear today. I don't have to think about does this need to be ironed. It is something that I do on the weekend that reduces my decisions. And honestly, it also reduces my stress about being hurrying and being late in the morning. But here's an extra little bonus tip is often while I'm doing the ironing on Sunday afternoon, I listen to a TED talk or a podcast um, and I'd get a little PD and a little inspiration, a little motivation in there while I'm ironing those shirts. And so, what about you? It could be food prep. It could be the the plan for meals, a meal plan for the week. Um, and that then backs up to the gr- trip to the grocery store. Um, because, you know, once you use up all those decisions on, okay, here's what we are going to eat, and then you open up the pantry and the stuff you need to make it, you're missing one or two things. Again, frustration, it's a problem. And so there are ways where you can reduce the number of decisions that you make during the day by doing things proactively in the evening or on the weekend. And finally, I would just, again, recommend that you have a morning routine and or an evening routine where part of it is proactively reducing the number of decisions that you have to make on a work day. Okay, let's go on to strategy number five. Strategy strategy number five is called clarity is your friend. So when it comes to decision fatigue, clarity is your friend. Let me explain what I mean. All right, have you ever been in a meeting and you bring up an idea and you know this is a good idea, you feel good about it, but then some of the other people in the meeting, they kind of start picking it apart and talk about why it won't work. And they immediately get way down into the weeds and and they talk about logistics and the cost and like, well, who's going to stand at the door and sign people in and, you know, just things that they've already lost the big picture of the good idea and they just get into the weeds. Well, that's because um, they're not, it's not clear. You know, the, the idea is clear, but then, yeah, those, those logistics can be worked out later. But what do I mean when I say clarity is your friend? Well, when making decisions, a clear mission statement for your school is your friend. We all have mission statements at our school. And when I was ahead of school, I remember I was at a board meeting and my board adopted this practice after this, in, this, um, this specific example that I'm about to tell you about. I was at a board meeting. We were trying to make a difficult decision. We're wrestling with it. We're in the weeds, way in the weeds. And one of the board members says, well, let's read our mission statement. And they opened up their folder, and it was there on the inside flap of the folder. They read the mission statement for the school, and immediately the decision became clear. That the thing that we were thinking about deciding, one decision did not align with our mission statement, and the other um, choice did align with our mission statement. So clear policies and procedures in your family handbook clear policies and procedures in your employee handbook, your strategic plan, your accreditation recommendations. Clarity helps you. Clarity is your friend. And if you don't have a clear, we usually have a clear mission statement. Sometimes it's a paragraph and it's just all of these catchphrases and jargon thrown together. Um, But 
you know, a clear mission statement, clarity in the policies of your school helps to really reduce the number of decisions because if there are less gray areas, gray areas is where we live to make those decisions. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention is the idea of the North Star. And so we know that, um, you know, in the 1600s, 1700s, and when they're out on the high seas, that these captains of these big wooden ships, that they didn't have radar, they didn't have, um, you know, sophisticated navigational devices, they had the stars. And they would look for the North Star, that would orient them, and then that would guide them as to their course. And so we need a North Star. And big, complex decisions are easier when we have clarity of mission, clarity of policies, clarity of strategic goals. And so, again, clarity is your friend. And if we can stay out of that gray area as much as possible, decision fatigue is less of a problem because we're not wrestling with things, especially high stakes decisions. And we can get clarity from the mission statement and we can get clarity from those, those handbooks and those policies. Okay. Seven strategies to overcome decision fatigue. We're up to number six, give yourself fuel. Okay. I've talked about that two gallon bucket of water there are ways to make better decisions later in the day. So let's say that during the day, you know, the water cup here, a cup there, it's coming out, it's coming out, it's coming out. The afternoon, it's starting to get low. But even in the afternoon, there are ways to make better decisions later in the day. And two that we're going to talk about real quick, and I mentioned it briefly before, is glucose and move your body. Okay, so first of all, glucose. You've heard this before. Don't go to the grocery store hungry. Why is that? Well, we're more likely to make impulsive decisions. And so there's a study that was done at Florida State that linked impulsivity and low glucose levels. So before a decision or a meeting, especially if it's in the afternoon, grab a protein bar or your favorite healthy snack. I go for a protein bar that's high in protein. It's low in calories, low in fat. And um, just grab that and it can make a huge difference. And then real quick, you know, I said before that, uh, and I said last week on episode 11, when we were talking about New Year's resolutions and about self-care and some people, some administrators, some leaders at private school say, well, I'm too busy to eat lunch. Well, I think a real case can be made that lunch is very, very important to you for making good decisions in the afternoon. So again, glucose levels, um, whether it's eating lunch and or, especially in the afternoon, grabbing a snack, a real quick snack before a meeting, um, especially if it's late in the day. And then the second part of this is to move your body. We all know the research on how a movement break positively, positively affects our students. Well, the same is certainly true for us as private school leaders. So a quick walk around campus, a quick walk up and down the hall. Take the stairs when you go to the meeting. Walk at a brisk pace to go to the meeting if that's the best that you can do. But give yourself fuel to make better decisions, especially late in the day. Glucose and move your body. All right. And then number seven, remember schools are not emergency rooms. Okay. Now I know that our schools sometimes feel like an urgent care center. And most decisions feel urgent, but they're actually important. And there's a difference. So you're deciding about a student discipline issue. Should I suspend this student or expel this student? Well, what I've done many times is let the parents know, here's what happened. We're looking into it. Your child is suspended. We're going to gather information. We're going to look into this. And I'm going to decide tomorrow. And I'll get back to you. Um, you're deciding about employee dismissal or reprimand. Okay. Again, if it's late in the day, um, I've said before, mornings are for making decisions and afternoons are for gathering information to make decisions. What about a big budget decision? What time of day are you making that? And I can hear what you're saying. You're like, well, Mark, our board meetings are from 7 to 9 p.m. Like that's just when the board members are available. I get that. I had 21 years of board meetings, um, 10 months a year. We, that's a lot of board meetings. But 
where do you think the idea sleep on it came from? Um, you know, we, we are fresher, better, have let that information settle in. And so again, always a caveat, always a disclaimer, but our schools are not emergency rooms. We have to really remember that we can pause on things and make the decision the next day and gather a little more information. And then the last thing is don't feed the beast. What I mean by that is if you make decisions super quickly all the time, all the time, just immediate decisions on the spot or within a few minutes, then you are training your teachers, your board, your other administrators that they are going to get a quick answer and a quick decision from you. But if you start to say, I will look into that and get back to you in a few hours or I'll get back to you tomorrow morning, then you're starting to train them and get away from that um, impulsivity and that uh, urgency, that feeling of urgency that you need to make a decision. So don't feed the beast and sleep on it. And remember that our schools are not emergency rooms. Okay, the big takeaways from today's episode How can we overcome decision fatigue? First of all, remember the human capacity to make decisions is finite. And as you approach capacity, your ability to make good decisions falters and understanding what causes decision fatigue will help you manage your decision load. And there are seven strategies that I've shared with you today that can help you overcome decision fatigue. First of all, acknowledge that it's a real thing. There's lots of research to support that. Number two, plan your day. As much as possible, mornings are for decisions and afternoons are for gathering information to make his decisions, to make those decisions as much as possible. Number three, have an index card on the corner of your desk. Go to episode seven and listen at 615 for 10 minutes and you'll have a strategy that you will be much more productive, but also you'll always know what to do and you'll have less decision fatigue. Number four, proactively reduce the number of decisions that you make. Create a routine that limits the time you spend on making decisions about what to wear to school or what to eat for dinner. Number five, clarity is your friend. A clear mission statement, clear policies, and clear goals can guide you to make better decisions. Number six, give yourself fuel. Before a meeting, eat a healthy snack with some protein. Take a quick walk down the hall or around campus. Five minutes or less, three minutes or less. It can make you more energized and more clearly thinking as you make decisions, especially in the afternoon. And number seven, remember, schools are not emergency rooms. Everything feels urgent, but most things are actually important and can wait until the next morning. All right, so what's today's call to action? I want you to start a habit outside of school where you reduce the number of decisions you make in the morning. Okay, come up with a habit, a system that you work on in the evening or the weekend that reduces the number of decisions that you make in the morning. And whether that's your wardrobe or lunches or whatever it is, make that system and remember, do it on the weekend or in the evening to reduce your number of morning decisions. So let's wrap it up. I hope you got value from this episode. I want you to thrive and not just survive as you serve the students and teachers at your school. And my goal is to take my 30 years of experience and help you avoid the mistakes that I made early in my career. I've created a free resource for you called the six six things that every private school teacher wants from their leader. And this is a six page PDF that could be a game changer for you. And I really believe that if you do these six things, your teachers will be happy to follow you. And you can get your free guide by going to the privateschoolleader.com slash guide. And be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Today's show notes are at theprivateschoolleader.com slash episode 12. New episode of the podcast comes out every week on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm on Instagram at theprivateschoolleader, on Twitter at thepsleader. If you got value from this episode, please subscribe and share it with other leaders or aspiring leaders at your school. And I've been your host, Mark Minkus, and I just want to say I appreciate you and all the hard work that you're doing to serve the teachers and the students at your school. You're awesome. You're amazing. You're doing a great job. And I know that your time is precious, and I really appreciate you taking time to join me here today. And I will see you next time on the Private School Leader Podcast. And until then, always remember, 
to serve first, lead second, and make a difference.